In 2004, I told you I received a word from the Lord concerning going to Manchester, England. I'll tell you about that maybe tomorrow night. But uh, it's been a miraculous journey. 2007, I was standing in this room, and about right here was a young man that I'd never seen before, glowing in the Holy Ghost. It was packed just like this tonight. And uh, I can't get my eyes. I'm just keep on being drawn to this young man. He's just, he's in the crowd, but he's just burning. So I, I, I called him up on the platform and I said, where are you from? And he said, Manchester, England. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm blown away that he has flown to the United States, not to go see New York City or L.A., but to Hamilton, Alabama, because he had seen the ramp online. And his hunger for God caused him to come here. He began to pray over England, standing right here. And I remember, do you remember that, Eddie? And I, oh, and a glory bomb exploded in this room. I mean, a glory explosion happened in this place as intercession went out for a nation. My heart was bonded to this young man. And we became very, very close, not only in spirit, but as, as just dear friends. And he's a son to me in my heart. I believe in the anointing on his life. He left this place. He went back to Manchester, England. He began and started a prayer meeting in a city that is desperate in need of Jesus. 2% Christian, 2% Christian. A place that was in darkness. But he started a prayer meeting. And when I went over there in 2010 just to go see what was happening, because he called me, you've got to see this. I go over there, and he was running between four and 600 people for his prayer meeting meeting yeah he started a ministry called prayer storm and believe me it's been a prayer storm that's hit Europe and now God has raised him up he is leading this ministry God is using him mightily he is knitted to our heart in the mission of the ramp I mean guys all the way from Manchester England tonight I want you to make welcome James Aladrin Wow. 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 I am just blown away. It's been 10 years, 10 years when I first came here, uh, summer of 2007. And my life was rad radically turned around. And it's such an honor to, uh, to actually speak. This is my first time speaking at a ramp gathering. <laughs> So I'm really excited about this, and uh, I'm just so privileged and blessed of God. I want to introduce my wife to everyone, my beautiful wife, Rebecca. Do you want to stand and just say hi to everyone? So we've been married five years. We've got a son, Justice is his name. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, God has just been so incredibly amazing in our lives. And um, my wife and I serve on the uh, John St Pastors John Stacy Ramp UK. I don't, where are they? Are they here? Anywhere? Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just so honoured to serve alongside, serve the leadership of Pastors John Stacy in Manchester with Ramp UK, because God is doing incredible things, and they are world class leaders. And I don't just say that because I'm up here. I do say that all the time. You guys, world class leaders. And I'm just so expect, yeah, go on, give a round of applause. I am, I am so excited about what God's going to do through them and through Ramp UK. And it's just an honor and a privilege to run with Ramp UK. And, uh, you know, I've made, I've made some friends here that have just become lifelong friends. Brian Bisley, I don't know where Brian Bisley is. Well, you know, I mean, when I first came to the Ram 2007, I remember staying with Brian, and I was so impacted by his life in God, and I'm still impacted by his life in God, and that, people, is a man of God. <laughs> he is a man of God. You know, and uh, I remember spending time with him in his car, just praying in the spirit. And I'm just like, wow, who are these guys? I mean, where are they from? I mean, you know, I was just so challenged by the fire and the passion, you know, and uh, just Im incredible people I've met here that have just, you know, this house, the ramp has become a place of encouragement, a place of rebuke. 
I mean, over the years, a place of uh, refiring, of fueling, everything. So, I mean, my journey, my story is so connected to this place. You know, I'm just so grateful to God. I don't have time to go into my history and all that God did. Uh, but I just want to honor Miss Karen. Karen Wheaton. So... Yes, she is an incredible leader, incredible leader, so sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and I'm just learning so much, so much. You know, the moment that she talked about that I, got, I was on the stage back in 2007 that changed my life and really was just so significant for what God is calling me to, I had no idea about it, but that moment happened because of her sensitivity to the Spirit. I remember worship was going on and just said, you know what, I feel like God wants to do something different today. And just called a few of us up on the platform and boom, there was an explosion and my life was changed forever. <laughs> So it was just the sensitivity to know what God, I mean, I, I just honor you so much as a spiritual mother, as a woman who's followed God, and uh, I'm just so impacted by your obedience. So thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, the list goes on. I'll be here forever if I'm going to mention everyone, but I'm just so grateful for this place. So grateful for this place. Um, uh, back in 2007, I, I was watching a live stream uh, from this place. Uh, I was in Manchester. I was watching a program. Uh, and I heard uh, uh, Miss Karen talk about a 40-day fast that everyone was going to be going on. And Lou Ingle, uh, uh, from the call, had called this 40-day fast. And the 40-day fast was, was going to end on 7707. So um, at the time, I just finished university. So... Um, I was about to finish, so I decided I would go on this fast. It was my first 40-day fast, Daniel fast that went on. And as I look back at my life now, 10 years on, I realize everything I'm doing now, everything God's doing with me, started with those 40-day fast, with that 40-day fast. You know, the 40-day fast is like uh, the 40 weeks of pregnancy. <laughs> and when you learn how to carry the burden of God or the, uh, the word of God, it's like a seed in you. And in the fast, it grows in you and God begins to deal with things in you. And what I didn't realize was in those 40 days, God gave birth to something in me that I am reaping the benefits of now 10 years later. All because I heard you talk about 40 day fast. And I was like, I'm going to go on that fast. And that fast changed my life. I came here. My life was impacted. See, as I look across this place, um, it reminds me of something that came to my mind when I was here back in 2007. And it was this. You don't know you're asleep until you wake up. Some of you looking at me are asleep. You're here, but you're not here. You, you've not yet woken up to some things in God. And I believe before this is over, was the word about three days, right? Three days. Before this is over, you're going to find yourself awake to God and think to yourself, what have I been doing all my life? It's almost like, you know, when you wake up to the reality of God, something happens on the inside. And I know God's going to do that with you because that happened with me in 2007. I was, God did something so significant in my life right here at the ramp. I came to the ramp during that 40-day fast. After the ramp, I went to the call. Nashville, Tennessee, 7707. I don't know if anyone here was there back then, but uh, again, my life was radically turned around. Uh, 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 in Nashville, in the stadium, there was about 77,000 young people gathering together to fast and pray for 12 hours. Did you hear what I said? 12 hours. It wasn't, some of you are kind of getting tired because we're worshiping for an hour. I mean, 12 hours in the boiling heat, if you remember that day. It was, it was incredibly hot. I, I remember it so clearly. Now, while I was in the stadium, this is very important. While I was in the stadium, I felt the Lord say to me, James, you will mobilize like this for prayer in the UK. 
Now, I had no idea about that. I, as in, it wasn't like I was dreaming up an idea because it was the last thing on my mind. But I knew it was a word from God, so I took note of it. When I got back to Manchester, I started mobilizing people to pray. Uh, young people, prayer gatherings, prayer meetings, small groups. And then one day, I, I just feel the need to gather these groups together to have a day of prayer for the city. So this two years on, 2009. So I am in my room praying and asking God, Father, what do I call this meeting? And um, I feel the Lord uh, gave me the name Prayer Storm. It says, call this Prayer Storm. And I just thought, well, that's, well, that's just a great name. So I just ran with Prayer Storm. And... Um, now, over the years, I've got to connect with uh, Luengo Moyes, a spiritual father to me, and I just really hold him such a high regard as a man of God in this world, not just this nation, uh, because uh, anyway, God has used him in a significant way in my life. Now, I come to find out, having been connected with Luengo, that the call, are you tracking with me? This is important for where I'm going in a few moments. The call started in 2000, okay, September 2nd, 2000, and 400,000 people gathered to fast. Did you hear what I said? 400,000 people gathered to fast and pray for 12 hours in Washington, D.C., right? Now, that gathering did not just come out of thin air. Okay, there was a backstory to that kind of mobilization. You don't mobilize people on that scale for fasting and prayer without doing your homework in the spirit realm. For three years before that gathering happened, Lou and his team went around America gathering people to fast and pray for sometimes three days, five days. And those meetings were called prayer storm. So three years they're having prayer storms that then, ex and do you know what they were praying in those meetings? They were praying in those meetings, Lord, let stadiums be filled in America with fasting and prayer. So they're praying that for three years, okay? They call those meetings prayer storm. September 2000, God answers the prayer, and 400,000 people gather to fast and pray, okay? 2007, I am in this, the, the meeting, the call, and God says to me, James, you mobilize like this for prayer in the UK. Two years later, 2009, I'm saying, Lord, we're doing these prayer meetings, and we feel to gather the people in the city for a day of prayer. What do we call this meeting we're about to have? God gave me the same name that he gave Lou Engel. The call was a prayer storm before it became the call. And the fact that God gave me that name, prayer storm, and I just realized this, I believe the prophetic picture that just like the prayer storms in America led to mass gatherings of fasting and prayer that fill stadiums and are still going on, I believe the prayer storms happening in England. Are you with me? Are you with me? Pastors Joe and Stacey, are you with me? Somebody, I'm telling you, the prayer storms happening in the UK is going to lead to mass mobilizations of fasting and prayer across the whole island, across the north, the south, the east, the west, the, you know, England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, all of them. They're going to gather in their thousands, not because of a great preacher, not because of a great singer, not because of a great worship band, but because they're hungry for the Lord. They're hungry for a move of God. So right now we prophesy into the airwaves. We prophesy to the United Kingdom. We say, wake up, wake up, wake up. It is time for awakening. Let the movement of prayer begin to sweep over the whole nation and let there be a great awakening. Let the prayer movement usher in the great awakening. I declare and we declare over the United Kingdom, it's not over. It's not over. God is not finished with the UK. God is not finished. We're about to go into something we've never seen or heard before we prophesy the movement of prayer arise in the name of Jesus someone say amen. amen so that's very that's very important for where I'm going um, so prayer storm started I had we had the first gathering in 2009 May the 16th and it was an incredible gathering I had no idea of what to do next because um, I don't, I don't burn with ambition to preach. And I, I don't see myself as a preacher. And I always like to say this. I burn to pray. 
when I preach, I can move men and women, but when I pray, I can move angels and demons. I'd rather be moving angels and demons than moving the souls of men. I'd rather be famous in heaven than be famous on the earth. There are many famous preachers on the earth who are not known in heaven. I don't care about being known on the earth. I don't care about being on TV. That's a lot of rubbish. I'd rather be known in heaven and be known in hell than be on Christian TV. Okay, so I, I'm, not, I'm not burning with an ambition just to have a big ministry, okay? So when we had the first prayer some gathering, I just knew I'd done what God had called me to do. I wasn't going to do anything else. I was just like, okay, God, that's done, and I've just moved on the rest of my life because <laughs> I don't see the point of doing another meeting because the last one was good just for the sake of it. Until, so this is May 2009, this happened, and then going into, um, I don't know, September 2009, I start to have a strange experience where I start to see the number 1111 everywhere. Now, I want to read this scripture to you. It's Matthew 17, 11. Jesus answered and said to them, talking to the disciples, Peter, James, James and John, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come, and they did not know him, but they, but they did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Look at verse 11. It says, Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah is coming. That's a prophecy. But then he also says, Elijah has come. He's declaring what's currently going on. Elijah has come. He's talking to them about this. John the Baptist who carried the spirit of Elijah. And then he says, Elijah is coming. I don't know if you know the scripture in John where Jesus says, the time is coming and now is. When the true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and truth. Well, is the time coming or is it now? Well, the answer is it's both. The time is coming and it's now. Elijah is coming and Elijah is here. It's what, God, it's what Jesus was saying to his disciples. And this is incredible because we need to understand that this prophetic word is so significant for our generation. In 2009, around that time of September, I start to see this number, 11, 11, everywhere. Now, this doesn't happen to me now, but I know sometimes when God is really trying to get my attention and speak to me, I start to see certain patterns, and I can't get away from it. It's just everywhere, you know, and I'm just, Lord, what are you saying? I'm praying. I look at, my, I look at the time. It's 11, 11. I go on my emails, downloading 11, 11 messages. I just, look at this. It's 11, 11. Everywhere. Anybody, anyone had that kind of experience before? <laughs> And I'm like, God, what are you saying? God, what are you? So I am praying about this. Lord, what does 1111 mean? Now, by the way, my birth date is 1111. I knew God wasn't just talking to me about my birth date. I knew there was more to it than that. So 2009, November 11th, on my birthday, I'm praying. Now, I don't know if we still do iPods these days, but I had an iPod then. And I, I was just praying and in fact, I think this is really supernatural because I did not turn on the iPod. I was just having my prayer time. And the iPod turns on itself and a song starts to play. And the song is a song by Eddie James, Prepare the Way of the Lord. If you know that song, there is a, there is a clip, I don't know if it's still online, of Luengo being here leading that prayer. Prepare, and, and, and Eddie James was playing. So it was that, it's on the first Ramp album, okay? I don't know if anyone has the album. <laughs> But there's that track, Prepare the Way of the Lord. <laughs> that moment and that song and everything about it, it was just life-changing for me. So I am just having my prayer time. The iPod turns on by itself and starts to play this song. As this song is playing, I'm having an encounter with God. Because I'm just weeping and weeping. I'm not quite sure why, but I feel like something significant is going on. And then it dawns on me, this is what God is trying to speak to me about what 1111 means. For me, I felt like God was talking to me about the spirit of Elijah. John the Baptist, Matthew 1111. 11. 
talks about John the Baptist, the greatest man born of a woman. I feel like God was saying to me this. The spirit of Elijah rested upon John. Okay? And John's mission was to prepare the way of the Lord. Who is he preparing the way for? He's preparing the way for Jesus. What is Jesus? Jesus is a type of revival. Jesus is revival. Revival is God's arrival. He's here and he's coming. See, you think you understand and appreciate the presence of God, but I can say to you, you don't really know certain dimensions of the presence of God. There are dimensions of the presence of God that manifest and you think you're going to die. Okay, so, so he's here and he's coming. We don't still know dimensions of his presence. The John who rested on Jesus' chest was the same John who saw Jesus in the fullness of his glory and fell like a dead man. Do you know that kind of glory? Most of us don't. And in fact, God protects us from that glory, actually, because we're crying out for it, but we're not ready for it. You're saying, God, show me your glory. If that glory came, you would die. Because your life is not in order to handle that kind of weight. Why do you think, see, in, in, in the New Testament, in fact, in the, in the charismatic church in our day, we like to talk about the love of God and how awesome God is and how his, He loves us so much. And that is true. And that's absolutely true. But we don't tend to talk about the other parts of God that are not that popular. The consuming fire parts. The part that says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God. Okay? We don't tend to talk about that part. And we've got to realize that God is not just the God of love. He's also a God of consuming fire. So Elijah, John carries the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord. And I feel like God was saying to me, just like John carried the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for a manifestation of the presence of God in his generation, John did that to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus. I felt like God was saying, the spirit of Elijah that rested upon John is going to rest upon a generation to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus. Are you tracking with me? Are you tracking with me? Are you tired? I should be tired because I've got a bit of jet lag. So I expect you to be wide awake. Are you with me? The same spirit that rested upon John to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus is going to rest upon a generation to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus. And that spirit is going to look like it looked on John. John was intense. John was radical. John was unusual in his generation. Read through the whole Bible. By the way, we talk about believing the Bible cover to cover, but many of you have not read this Bible cover to cover. So all you do is listen to preachers and don't actually know what God's saying in his word. And you build your life on someone else's revelation as opposed to your personal encounter with God in this book. That's a side note. Get in the Bible. Get in the Bible. Can I just go on a rabbit trail a bit? <laughs> Remind me where I was. <laughs> no, this is very important because I've really been stirred about just the importance of the word in our generation. Most of you don't read your Bible to just encounter God. I, I recently got connected with a guy in Uganda who uh, uh, used to be a witch doctor. Very much involved in the occult. He got radically saved. And then in his... Uh, uh, you know, just following God radically, uh, he had a, a sickness in his body, cancer. And he went to the doctors and they started doing all the stuff, you know, examinations and chemothera chemotherapy and all that stuff on his body. And they made some mistakes in all they were doing. And I think they damaged some nerves. So now he, he lost his eyesight and he's paralyzed from his waist down. He starts to lose weight, like just cr rapidly. And uh, uh, the pores on his body is pus. So he is like in constant agony and pain. So the doctors gave up on him. Just leave him to die. Um, now, God spoke to a woman and said, go to his hospital and just read the word to him. Now, listen to this. Listen. The Lord spoke to this lady to not pray. Just go to his hospital and read 25 chapters of the Bible every day. 
out loud. 25 chapters. Do you know how long she did that for? Seven months. At the end of seven months, this guy's lying down. Everyone's wondering why he's not dying. His eyes pops open. He sees Jesus, this is not vision, walks into his room. And Jesus says to him, I'm healing you now. Now, there's a scripture in Psalms that says he sent his word and it heals them. (laughs) The healing was in the word. This guy said he was so full of the word after being de- after the word being declared over him 25 chapters a day. He was so full of the word that the word now manifested in flesh. Get in the word. Everyone say get in the word. Get in the word. Don't don't just hear a sermon. Speak it, read it, meditate it, think it, memorize it, whatever, sing it. Whatever you can do, let the word be a part of your life. Even the parts that are the begats and the begets. Every single part of the word, read it, speak it, believe it. Even if you don't know what it means. Because there's life in the word. Now, where was I? Yes. Thank you. John the Baptist... The spirit that rested upon him is going to rest upon a generation to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus. Now, I want to go somewhere, but before I go there, I need to make this point. I got distracted by a rabbit trail. (laughs) We know the presence of God in a certain dimension right now, but we're not ready for the dimension God wants to release. Because if that dimension were to come, it's going to destroy us. Good example is Ananias and Sapphira. When it's kind of like the brighter the light is, the more you see things you never noticed before. And the greater the glory, the more instant the judgment. So you want the glory of God? Well, it calls for a whole new kind of lifestyle. When God has a special mission, it puts a demand on a life for a special lifestyle. Okay, now this is where I'm going. Track with me. Jesus prophesies in Matthew 17, 11, that Elijah is not just here, but he's coming. Listen clearly to this. If Elijah is coming, so is Jezebel. If Elijah is here and coming, Jezebel is here and coming. And you need to understand that one of the major battles we're going to deal with in our generation is the spirit of Jezebel. Now, I'm not here to talk to you about the spirit of Jezebel in the way many of you think, because people in the church generally tend to think about a strong woman leader who sometimes may not have people's skills as someone who has the spirit of Jezebel. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about. And mostly that's wrong. Jezebel is not a woman. It's a spirit. Probably more males have the spirit of Jezebel than even women. (laughs) Okay, so I'm not here to say Jezebel is a woman or, you know, the, the, someone in your church that you don't get on with and you find them very controlling. That may, well, that may be, but it's not always the case. So let's not just label everything Jezebel if we don't know what it is. Are you with me? So I'm not here to talk about that. However, I'm here to show you some important things I believe God wants you to be aware of if you're going to be the army that God is raising up in these last days. Listen to me. The message of holiness may not draw a crowd but it will ultimately build the army of God. God wants to build an army. God wants to build an army. Everyone say, God God wants to build build an an army. We cannot be an army if you are not a soldier. We cannot be an army if you are not a soldier. How can we be an army fighting an enemy when you don't know how to use your weapons? How can we be an army fighting an enemy when you don't understand orders? When you don't understand just just 
just the protocol of spiritual life and warfare and just how things work in the kingdom. How can we be an army if you don't know who you are? So we can sing and shout all we want, but if we don't learn how to be an army, we're ineffective in advancing the kingdom of God. And if we're an army, we have an enemy. Now our goal is not to always focus on the enemy. We don't exalt the enemy, we exalt Jesus. It's stupid to always focus on the enemy, but it's equally stupid to ignore the enemy. You cannot be an army in a battle trying to bring down an enemy and be ignorant of the enemy you're up against. Many people in the church are ignorant of what we're up against. And we're in a battle, people. And I'm telling you, it's a life and death battle because many of you have been influenced, have been influenced, have been paralyzed by this spirit and you don't even realize what's going on. Revelations 2.18, I'm going to move quickly. Revelations 2.18, Jesus speaks to the church of Tyre. And he says this, these things says the son of God, whose eyes are like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, patience, faith, your patience. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow, everyone say allow. allow. That woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and su to seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Now it gets intense. Jesus is saying this. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed. Pause. When was the last time you heard someone preach a message on Jesus casting someone in a sick bed? This is not going to be that popular in a lot of our churches today but you can't take it out of the bible it's right there and jesus said it i will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds see in our generation we have this idea that the god of the old testament is a bit horrible and the god of the new testament is nice have you read the book of revelations it's the same God. He hasn't changed one bit. And I want to say to you, don't just read the New Testament. Read the Old Testament. Read everything, even the bits you don't understand. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I will cast her into a sick bed unless she repents of her deeds. It gets even more intense. I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I give and I will give to each one of you according to his works. Now I say to you and the rest of Tyre, as many as do not have this doc doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. Verse 25, but hold fast to what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works till the end, to him I will give power over nations. Now I, I find this really fascinating. The intensity that Jesus is talking to the church in. You don't, you don't think of Jesus in this way that often. Jesus is saying to this woman Jezebel and saying to the church, because you're tolerating this woman Jezebel, if she does not repent, I'll put her in the sick bed and I'll kill her children. That's not, that's not uh, her physical children. It's, it's her disciples, those who are following her teachings. Now, Jesus is very intense in judgment against this spirit because this spirit is ruthless and this spirit is intense. And this spirit is after the seed of God. It's after the purpose of God. It's after the purposes of God in our generation. And the judgment that Jesus shows against the spirit is a level of the passion he feels about this spirit being rooted out of his people. Now look at this. He says, that woman Jezebel, you tolerate her, she, uh, she teaches and she seduces my servants. To commit sexual immorality. Everyone says sexual immorality. I want you to understand 
that one of the main ways the spirit of Jezebel functions is the release of sexual immoralities. Jezebel is a spirit. It's on men and on women. It's not just a spirit that's on women. The spirit of Jezebel is alive and well in the church of America. The spirit of Jezebel is alive and well in the church of the world. The western church even more so. The age we live in and the hour we live in is an hour of sexual turbulence where the atmosphere is charged with a spirit of lust. One of the major strongholds we're facing in our generation is this spirit of Jezebel that wants to infiltrate the culture. And you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, you commit adultery in your heart when you look with lust. In other words, your imagination is his reality. Now, Joel 2.28 says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men, will, your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. The language of the outpouring of the spirit of God is dreams and visions. Dreams and visions work with your mind. The spirit of Jezebel is after polluting your mind. So it doesn't matter how clean the water is. If the cup is dirty and you pour the water into the cup, you have dirty water. So the enemy wants to contaminate the vessel to render you ineffective so that you're not able to fulfill the purpose of God in your generation. And one of the key ways the spirit of Jezebel works is through your eyes. Everyone say eyes. eyes. Yes, eyes. He says, if you look at a woman with lust or a man with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. It's amazing that the revelation of Jesus to the church that is plagued with sexual immorality, the revelation Jesus gives of himself to the church that is plagued with sexual immorality is a revelation of his eyes. If you read the seven churches, he reveals a different aspect of himself to each church. But the church that's plagued with sexual immorality the revelation he gives of himself to them is his eyes. The spirit of Jezebel is working through the eye gates. And the Lord wants you to have a revelation of his fiery eyes. His fiery eyes is your pathway to breaking the hold of that spirit on your life. You will not walk in freedom just by... 10 steps and this accountability, even though all those things are awesome. You heard Pastor Micah say that similar thing yesterday. What's going to get you walking in freedom and staying free is that you're walking in a place where your eyes are engaging with his eyes. And the fire in his eyes transfers to, the, to your eyes and to your heart. So it's not just something you sing about. It's something that's happening in here. When that becomes reality and not just theology, then you start to, yeah, when that becomes something you're living in, then you start to really understand what we're talking about. When we say freedom is not the length of time between sin cycles. That freedom is when the chain is broken. And you actually live free. Jesus said to the woman called adultery, go and sin no, go and sin no more. Isn't he going to sin every so often and ask for repentance? He said, go and sin no more. The same bondage you were in, he's saying, now you're not supposed to live in that bondage anymore. So the cross of Jesus is not a sin management program. It's a sin eradication program. Have you bought into the idea that you're just going to keep struggling with this cycle? 
I'm here to say to you, you're called to live in a place of deliverance from the cycle. No more. Everyone say, no more Jezebel. Yes. The spirit of Jezebel attacks the eye. The answer to Jezebel's attack on your eyes is to now behold the Lamb. <laughs> the Lamb of God. To have your gaze fixed on the Lamb of God. Now look at Samson. Samson lost his consecration and then his power. The enemy did not start attacking Samson's power. The enemy started attacking Samson's conse consecration. Okay. He attacked his consecration and then he got him. When the enemy, sorry, when Samson lost his consecration and then his power, what did the enemy take from him? His eyes. His eyes. Sexual immorality causes you to lose your vision. The enemy taking out Samson's eyes was not just a physical, the enemy taking out Samson's eyes was just a physical manifestation of what had already happened in the spirit when Samson lost his consecration. So Samson's eyes being taken out was a picture of something that was already has already happened in the spirit based on Samson's compromise. Samson lost his calling because of what he looked at. He entertained things with his eyes that he had no business entertaining. If you do nothing in radical pursuit towards God, you would end up being victimized by the assault of lust against your sexuality. If all you do is come to church and ramp conference and hear a nice sermon, raise your hands, jump up and down and go home. If that's all you do, by default, you backslide. You will not maintain fire for God just by going to conferences. Because in conferences like this, you can ride on the wave of other people's fire. What you need is something that's burning in here. That can be sustained outside of this place. When I first came to Ramp in 2007, I was so impacted by the presence of God. As amazing as those conferences and those meetings and the preach and everything was, while I'm over here worshiping God, all that's on my mind is I can't wait to get home and pray. And it starts to dawn on me what will happen if we start judging how great a meeting is. Not by the presence of God we feel in the meeting, but by the desire for the presence of God we feel when the meeting is over. Don't just get excited here. Think about how this is going to work out at home. By the way, if your Christianity doesn't work at home, don't bother exporting it. This has to be real in here. This has to be real at home. Otherwise, you're just putting on a show. Okay? Now, I want to share with you a dream I had. There was, uh, 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 I, I don't know if it was last year or recently, in the last couple of years, I found myself praying uh, prayer just because uh, we lead a prayer movement and we do a lot of prayer things. And I, I just found myself praying, Lord, show me what we're really up against in our generation. And I started to pray this prayer. Lord, I need to open my eyes to really see what we're dealing with in terms of the opposition and the darkness. So one day I had this dream. And in this dream, I was given this room. And in this room, there's this wall behind me um, and on this wall are uh, all these idols like eastern idols and you know you know buddha and all these things and this wall from the top to the bottom is full of all these idols now as it tends to happen in dreams sometimes in the dream i was in two states i was in my body but i was out of my body so i could observe the situation in the dream, my back was to this wall, and on my right side, like right here, was this particular idol that was not just an idol. It was like a person because I could feel its power in the dream. It was like so overpowering. The best way to describe this idol is the head of Medusa. If you know anything about Greek mythology, it's the head of a woman, and the hair is just snakes. Now, I didn't know much about this, as in, in terms of just my natural mind, about what Medusa was. But in the dream, I was aware that I was not supposed to look at this head. Now, 
in the dream, I'm, I'm feeling the passion intense in my heart. I want to take this head off the wall. I want to cut it, the, head, the head off the wall. And this is the, this is the sad part of the dream. In the dream, I did not have my sword. But I had an intense desire to cut the head off this thing. Every time I moved backwards, I'm observing the situation as well as in my body. Now, I'm not looking at it, but I'm trying to get it off. Now, if you know the, the story goes, whoever looks at Medusa turns to stone, right? So, I am trying not to look at this thing. And every time I move back to try to take his head off, it's like I feel the power of this spirit so much. And I'm feeling really frustrated in the dream because I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get the head of this Medusa off the wall. So I woke up in this state of frustration and I was really annoyed. <laughs> because, listen, dreams don't take them lightly. So I'll come back to the prophetic dream in a moment. Your body sleeps, but your spirit never sleeps. So when your body sleeps, your spirit is active. If your spirit is strong, when your body is sleeping, your spirit is winning battles in the spirit realm. If your spirit is weak, when you sleep, you have dreams where you're being tormented and you have dreams where you're having perverse things going on, okay? It's because of what you've allowed in your body. There are many access points that allow these things to happen. So don't just take your dreams lightly. And from experience, <laughs> I've realized, you don't just, I, I don't just go into any house and just sleep on the bed without praying in the room. I've got another dream we're going to show you in a moment. Because when you go into a place, you know, Jacob was, uh, was traveling and he laid his head on the stone. And he had a spiritual encounter in his dreams based on what the person who was there before had done. So he was able to have a heavenly experience because of the person who was there who built an altar to God. The same is also true on the negative side. I don't have time to go into it, but I just felt I needed to really make that point. Don't take your dreams lightly. I woke up in this frustrated state dealing with this spirit, almost like, God, I need to deal with this. You know, get, so I'm, I'm just praying. We had a conference that day at the conference. I'm teaching, so I felt the need to share the dream. And as I shared the dream, I felt like we all needed to go into a time of confession. Tolera confession in terms of us all confessing our toleration for the spirit of immorality. Com confession for us uh, uh, tolerating the spirit of Jezebel. People are confessing pornography. I mean, pornography right now is just sweeping the church and is just binding leaders and people. I mean, we talk about the spirit of seduction. The spirit of seduction is not just out there in the world and even out there in the pews. It's actually out here in the pulpits too. So, I mean, it's a huge deal. When we talk about the spirit of Jezebel, it's working uh, through all these means to release perversion. In the, in the conference, we ended up confessing our sins and all these things. Everyone was just confessing, Lord, we refuse to tolerate the spirit of Jezebel. People were confessing their addictions to pornography, as in the whole conference. It's not just calling a few people forward to confess. Everyone, we're com Lord, every in what toleration of the spirit of Jezebel in me, Lord, I'm confessing it, deal with it. Every gaze, everything that's just tickled my heart or moved my affections in the wrong way. We're just confessing. So we're doing this for a while. After the conference, I go home. When I got home, we've got this thing called Apple TV. So we, I turned on Apple TV. Right there on the screen is the head of Medusa that was in my dream. However, this time it is cut off. And the guy who was cut it off is holding a sword. And he's holding the head of Medusa like that. <laughs> When I saw that, I knew that God was confirming to me something that happened in the spirit based on our confessing and asking God to cleanse us of every inward toleration of the spirit of Jezebel. Now, I'm going to rush through this. Uh, 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 1 Kings 18, 19. It says, now, therefore, send, this is uh, Elijah. Therefore, we're going to look at, at the spirit of Jezebel in the Old Testament and how Jezebel died. Because I believe it's a prophetic word to this generation and to many of you in this room. Therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, 
the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Everyone say, who eats at Jezebel's table? So Baal was the god of the Canaanites, the god of fertility and the god that brought forth rain. They had sexual orgies to call that rain. They had prostitution in their religious institutions and the worship of Baal. So when we talk about gathering these prophets of Baal, these, 450, these prophets of Baal uh, and the prophets of Asherah were producing sexual immorality all over the culture. They were releasing the ideologies of perversion all over the people of God and the whole nation. Welcome to the media of today. Our TV shows, our music videos. Perhaps Hollywood could be one of the greatest places where we could say the prophets of Asher and Baal are alive and well. Prophesying immorality all over the culture. And many of you... Your phones and your iPads and your TVs are like the tables that you eat on. So now you're eating food sacrificed to idols by what you're entertaining on your iPad and on your iPhone and on your TV. Because those things have come from demonic ideologies. Perverse ideologies. And because you're allowing that into your home, because you're allowing that on your phone, you're influencing the atmosphere around you. You're coming to agreement with that spirit. And you're giving that spirit influence and authority in your life, in your family. So this is a time for us as the people of God to be careful what we are watching, what we are listening to. You, you, you can't just listen to anything. You can't just watch any movie. You can't just do it. These days, listen, the darkness is going to increase. And have you heard the story of, you know, the, the point of you put a frog in hot water, it jumps out. You put the same frog in warm water and gradually turn up the heat. It doesn't detect the change in temperature. That's exactly how the enemy is killing us in our generation. What we allow on our phones and our TVs, on all the adverts right now, compared to what was allowed 50 years ago, even 20 years ago, the unbelievers then will look at the Christians now and say, you're out of your mind. But we have, we have been uh, accustomed to these things because our sense, we have been desensitized by the gradual turning up of the darkness and now we're accepting abnormal as normal. And normal as abnormal. So a generation is being conditioned by the spirit of Jezebel. But what I love about this is how Jezebel dies. <laughs> I'm telling you, this bit, the Lord gave me this revelation in May. And I was just shaking like, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. It's incredible. What I believe God is saying to this generation. So uh, uh, the guy who was anointed... To go and kill Jezebel is a guy called Jehu. Everyone say Jehu. Jehu. Second Kings 9.20. Jehu is riding. A watchman sees him riding on his horse. And he's on his way to go and destroy Jezebel. Look at what it says. I'll just read a part of verse 20. It says, he went up to them and he's not coming back. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Ah, <laughs> he drives furiously. You know what that reminds me of? Uh, Matthew 11. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Jehu was anointed in the secret place. If you read the story carefully, Jehu was anointed with a compounded anointing. 
The anointing that came from Elijah was doubled on Elisha and then was sent through someone to go and pour on Jehu. So Jehu is now carrying not just Elisha's, but Eli is carrying a compounded anointing. Which is a picture of the multi-generational nature of what God wants to do in our generation. He's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What he starts with one generation, he wants to carry on in the next. Elijah should have destroyed Jezebel, but it was passed on from generation to generation. And now that anointing is compounded and is coming on Jehu. And when it manifests on Jehu, it manifests like the John the Baptist anointing. It is furious. It is angry. It is violent in the spirit. Not in the flesh. It is in the spirit. When we're talking about spiritual violence, it's not about just gritting your teeth and being angry in the flesh. It's about a, a sense of holy anger against everything that stops you from being radical in devotion to God. You know, when you see us here on the platform and you see people just going hard after God and crying out to God, we're not trying to earn anything from God. We're, I think we sang in one of the songs saying we're going to hotly pursue him. And, you know, I forgot that song we're singing earlier where we kind of reversed it. And we say, God, we're going to kick down the walls and we're coming furiously after you, violently. It's like we're saying, God, we are hungry for you. We know you're with us. We know you're here, but we know there is more. And we're not trying to earn anything. We're seeking you because we know you love us. We're not seeking you so that we earn your love. In fact, we're not praying uh, to earn his love. We're praying and fasting because we are loved by him. We are praying from the place of acceptance, not praying for acceptance. It's the violent spirit that will destroy the spirit of Jezebel. So you can't be casual about this. And I love this saying that the casual approach to prayer is producing casualties all over our generation because you're taking your worship like casual, you're taking your prayer life casual, and you think you're going to overcome the spirit of loss. You have to get spiritually violent about it. You need to get angry in the spirit. You need to start to ride your horse with fury and violence in the spirit. And you cannot afford to tolerate that spirit anymore. I'm telling you, this is significant for you all because many of you come to places like this and you show a bit of passion for God. Maybe you might jump around a bit and whatever. But then you go home, you watch football, American football, whatever it is you're into, or soccer as you call it, <laughs> basketball, and you're all emotionally involved. So you're so stirred about the, about the thing, your, your video games, you're so stirred about it. Now, that is, that is out of order. Because that tells me those, the sports and the video games has more of your heart and emotion than God. Why should your sports and video games and all the other things have more of your heart than God? You can't, the first command, by the way, the first and the greatest commandment, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You cannot love the Lord, you go to all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your emotions be disconnected. You can't tell me, listen, if I were to set you on fire like right now, I don't care how timid you are, everyone here is going to know you're on fire. Look, look. If I were to set you on fire right now, you'd, it doesn't matter your personality type. You don't have to advertise fire. Real fire speaks. And by the way, it's not always in the volume because Hannah was praying fervently and she wasn't loud. But the person who saw her could tell that she was fervent and she was furious and she was intense. It was evident on her face. You cannot tell me you love God with all your household, mind and strength and worship God like this. But when you're watching your video, get playing your video games and watching your sports, you're all emotionally intense. Something is wrong with that picture. It is time for you to get violent about your relationship with God. 
That is the only way you're going to stay on fire. That's the only way you're going to overcome the lost. Now, look at how Jezebel dies. This is just incredible to me. 2 Kings 9.30 Now Jehu came to Jezreel and Jezebel heard of it. Do you know what Jezebel does? Jezebel hears that Jehu is coming to kill her. Do you know the first thing she does? This is amazing. She puts her makeup on. <laughs> Look. He says it there. He says, now Jehu had come to Jezreel and Jezebel heard it. This is 2 Kings 9.30. And she put, on her, she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head. And then looked through the window. What was she trying to do? She was trying to project to, uh, to Jehu a spirit of perversion. She knew that Jezebel, she, she knew that Jehu was coming to kill her because he's been anointed with that violent anointing. And she knew she could still try it on him. So she put her makeup on to beautify herself, and then look out of the window to project perversion to Jehu. It's amazing to me Jehu's response to this. Verse 31, and has Jehu entered the gate? It reminds me of the scripture that says that you possess the gates of your enemy because now Jezebel is looking through the window and, and Jehu is coming through the gate, a place of spiritual authority, right? She said to Jehu, is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? This is amazing. Because they need to understand who Zimri is. Zimri is the king who served the shortest time in the whole in the history of Israel. Zimri was king for seven days. Do you know how Zimri died? Zimri committed suicide. So Jezebel tried to project perversion. Perversion wasn't working. Then Jezebel tried to release the words of depression and suicide. Isn't that what happened to Elijah? When Elijah heard, when Jezebel released his, when Jezebel released her whatever words of threat against Elijah, he says, he didn't say Elijah heard it. He said Elijah saw it. Read it carefully in Kings. Elijah was spoken to. He says, now Jezebel swore that, you know, she's going to kill Elijah. You know how she said it. You know, let the gods do to me. You know the scripture. If you don't know it, look it up. <laughs> he says, and Elijah saw, and then he ran. So Elijah heard words, but he saw a vision. Jezebel is engaging two things, the eye gate and the ear gate. Jehu is coming to kill Jezebel, and she tries to engage his eye gate, but he did not engage. Look, look at what, Jeze look at what Jehu did. He says, verse 32, and Jehu looked at the window. Jehu did not look at Jezebel. He looked at the window. Everyone say the window. But Jezebel looked at Jehu. So Jehu projected perversion, but, uh, 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 sorry, Jezebel pro pro projected perversion, but Jehu did not engage. Now, you got to understand, in the culture we live in, it's very difficult for you to run away from perversion because it's everywhere around us. And what I want to say to you is, don't engage it. It can be there, but you can choose not to engage Jehu did not engage. Jezebel, Jezebel poked her head out to look. He didn't look at Jezebel, looked at the window. He did not engage. Now, how I know he didn't engage was what happened next. Okay, actually, before I go into that. So, the same thing Jezebel did with Elijah, he tries to do the same thing with Jehu. To engage his eye gate, because that didn't work. He then, she then tried to engage his ear gate, calling him Zimri. Who's a guy who committed suicide? Projecting depression onto him. Tell me, is that not what our generation is going through? If it's not sexual perversion, it is cutting yourself. By the way, that's how they worshiped as well. If you remember when they were on the Mount Carmel and they're worshiping and trying to call down fire, they did that by cutting themselves. Okay, that's all Jezebelic. Cutting themselves. 
and depression, suicidal thoughts. Could it be that all these things is connected to the spirit of Jezebel and trying to engage your eye gate and your ear gate? Now look at what Jehu did in verse 32. And Jehu looked at the window and said, who is on my side? So two or three eunuchs looked at him. The eunuchs looked at Jehu. That's very key. Because Jehu did not look at Jezebel. But the eunuchs looked at Jehu. And when the eunuchs looked at Jehu... Because Jehu was carrying a spirit of violence. And because Jehu received his anointing from the secret place. And in the secret place, what you experience in the secret place are the eyes of fire. Jehu's eyes are burning with fire. The eunuchs engage Jehu's eyes. And Jehu releases to the eunuch by their eye contact righteousness. It releases something to the eunuchs that disempowers the spirit of Jezebel that has bound them for so long. Because the next thing Jehu did is he engaged their eyes and then he spoke some words that engaged their ears. He says, who is on my side? Who? Then two of the three eunuchs looked at him, and then he said, throw her down. He engaged them, not just with his eyes, but with his words. He empowered the eunuchs to throw down Jezebel. Now, this is the bit that just got me really excited. Who are eunuchs? Oh, let's just pause a bit. Uh, Jehu is anointed to kill Jezebel, but actually Jehu did not kill Jezebel. Jehu did not kill Jezebel. Who killed Jezebel? Who killed Jezebel? Do you know who eunuchs are? They're people whose sexual reproductive organs have been cut off. I believe that's a prophetic picture of this generation. The people who have been oppressed in their sexuality by the spirit of Jezebel are actually the people that are anointed to destroy her. <laughs> ah! Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You are struggling with same-sex attractions. You're struggling with immorality and pornography. You're struggling with depression. You know what the enemy is trying to do? He's trying to bind you before you bind him. And if Elijah is coming, Jezebel is coming. And if Elijah is here, Jezebel is here. And that tells me there is an anointing like that of Jehu. The a violent anointing that God wants to project and release to you so that you can throw Jezebel down. You are called to destroy Jezebel. You are called to destroy the spirit of perversion. You are called to destroy the spirit of depression. You are called to destroy the spirit of immorality. Arise, warriors. Arise, 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 arise. You will not be bound by pornography. You will not be bound by depression. You will not be bound by suicidal thoughts. You are actually anointed to destroy Jezebel. That is what the fight is about. The enemy wants to bind you before you bind him. The reason why you're struggling is because you're like the eunuchs. You have been bound by the spirit for so long. You feel oppressed by the spirit for so long. But that's because your assignment is to destroy it. Somebody say, Jezebel is coming down. Say, Jezebel. It's coming down. Can I get some musicians? Jezebel is coming down. Now. 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 Oh. Do you know what destroys Jezebel? Fire. 
fire. I had another dream. In this dream, I was, um, I was, I, I, this is not a dream. I was speaking in London at a church. And I was meant to be preaching two nights at this church. I preached the first night. It was powerful. And one of the leaders came to me and said this. I went to, this is very important what I'm about to say. The leaders came to me and said, you know, when you were preaching, it was like you were dealing with things in our church like issues that debates and arguments that we had had as pastors. It's like you were just speaking directly into it. I didn't know what I was going on. I was just speaking prophetically. And God was moving. It was amazing. That night, I went to my hotel room. Remember what I said about praying in rooms before you sleep? Well, I prayed in this room because I've just learned from experience, experiences in the past to not take those things lightly. Pray over the room. Cover the room in the blood of Jesus. Take authority. Learn to take authority over atmospheres. Very important. I don't have time to teach on that right now. But anyway, I was praying, and I went to sleep. When I slept, I had a dream. And the dream was in the hotel room. So this is not a dream. I'm actually having an experience in the spiritual realm. I am in the hotel room. And do you know who walks into the hotel room? A naked woman, Jezebel, walks into my hotel room. This is the amazing thing. Exactly as it says in Revelations. She is seducing the prophets by teaching. She's teaching. So she's talking to me scriptures and acting like everything is okay. So she's actually almost preaching and talking things from the Bible. Which tells me, don't just get deceived because someone can preach there from God. Let's move on. She's talking to me Bible stuff. And I'm in the hotel room thinking... This is strange, but she is acting like this is not strange and this is okay. So after a while, I'm like, you must leave now. I say this to this spirit of Jezebel in my hotel room. You must leave now. The spirit would not leave. I said, you must leave now. The spirit would not leave. I said, I take authority over you. You must leave now. You know what happens? This uh, spirit starts to shake violently and starts to run out. And this is the bit I love. I ran after it and said, and I release the fire of God against you right now. Right there. Listen, it's disintegrated and I woke up. That night in that church, revival broke out. I mean, it was like something exploded in that church that night. And I knew I had fought a battle and won it in my sleep because I was building my spirit all along so while my body was asleep my spirit was winning battles and I was not gonna give Jezebel any foothold in my life can I get my musicians yes thank you thank you Eddie everyone say Jezebel Jezebel. is coming down I want you to move a few steps back Say Jezebel. Jezebel. I want you to say this with violence. Jezebel. Jezebel. You are coming down. down. Now. Now. There's some of you in here, you have struggled with perverse dreams. You sleep and you're sexually being harassed in your dreams. You're being bound. You're being tormented by the spirit of Jezebel. There's some of you, it's not the dreams, it's the pornography. You just find that you're not able to break this thing off. You are under the influence of the spirit of Jezebel. Some of you, it's not sexual issues, it is cutting yourself. It is constant bombardment of the spirit of depression and suicide. I'm telling you, it's also connected to the spirit of Jezebel. Say, Jezebel! Is coming down, coming down. Now. now. I want to invite you right now to come to this altar because I believe God is saying to you, Don't be afraid, don't be ashamed because I've actually anointed you to slay this spirit. And He sends you, Arise, mighty warrior. You are not a victim, you're a victor. 
You know, cause we bound in pornography or sexual addiction or same sex attractions or gender dysmorphia and confusion. You are called to be a warrior. You will destroy the spirit. You will destroy the spirit. We are going to break the hold of the spirit of Jezebel. It comes down. Everyone say, Jezebel is coming down now. If you can pray in the spirit right now, if you can pray, what is it pray right now? Today marks the end. Today, this ends today. A turn around. Where you are right now, I want you to cry out to God. Say, Father, the cycle breaks tonight. 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 Now, in the name of Jesus. Come on, come on, lift your voices, some warriors in this place. I wanted to pray, cry out to the Lord, release your spiritual violence, spiritual violence, spiritual violence, the violence taken by force, the violence taken by force. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Le manana moto le sakata le leba. Shiba kata le lebo soto la la bada. Shiba kata la la bala la moto ke sata la. E manana masana ma. Now, now, now. Let it 
destroy the spirit of Jezebel is an anointing of spiritual violence as in you get angry at the spirits there's no time for casual prayers I want to lead you in a prayer right now and what we're gonna do is as we finish this prayer we're all gonna begin to roar in the spirit are you with me and we're gonna pray for release chosen and some people on this platform to go and pray can I just say with all due respect don't go and lay hands on anyone if you're struggling in any way okay and it's okay just make sure that your heart is that the Lord releases you to do that this is so key can you lift your hands with me right now We're all going to say this together. Say, Father, cleanse me from every inward toleration of the spirit of Jezebel. We're going to say that again. Say, Father, cleanse me from every inward toleration of the spirit of Jezebel. One more time. Father, cleanse me from every toleration of the spirit of Jezebel. Let the blood of Jesus decontaminate my mind, my emotions, my body. I denounce perversion. I denounce immorality I denounce depression I denounce confusion I denounce self-harm in the name of Jesus Jezebel you come down now 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 lift up your voice lift up your voice oh yeah yeah Give a lot of 